Ravenfield is a single-player, large-scale combined arms shooter in early access, one taking very clear inspiration from the likes of Battlefront and Battlefield, inspiration that it wears very clearly on its sleeve. Now, before I get deep into this game, I need to clarify something right from the get-go, because Lord knows the devs have received enough grief having to answer this question repeatedly. This is a single-player game. There is no multiplayer. I know, it looks like a multiplayer game, sounds like a multiplayer game, even tastes like one. But the developer, Steel Raven, has made it very clear that this game is and always will exclusively be a single player game. The game is definitely trying to evoke memories of sitting down and playing the original Battlefront games, you know, playing matches against AI rather than being a competitive experience. If you are interested in playing this game multiplayer, there is an unofficial multiplayer mod, but when I tried playing it, it was pretty much dead. Ravenfield sets itself up as a fairly simple game, with the potential for some pretty goofy moments and large-scale battles rarely seen in other titles of its ilk. The first thing you'll probably notice about this game is the art style. It's certainly unique. The character, weapon and vehicle models lack any kind of detailed textures, instead opting to colour in parts of the meshes with solid colours. This actually kind of works since all the characters have the same silhouette. The bright red and blue colours of the units make them stand out really well against their environments and allows you to easily see who's friendly and who's not. The weapons look fairly simple but fit well within the art style. They also do a reasonably good job of communicating exactly what they are. This is an assault rifle. This is a grenade launcher. This is a sniper rifle. The only one that kinda doesn't fit would be the shotgun. It's got this sort of desert camo look going on, which clashes with the flat colour designs of the other weapons, and it's also not easy to tell just from a glance that it's actually a shotgun. It could just as easily be an SMG of some kind. The vehicles also fit well within the visual style of the game, with them all using a flat green colour with gunmetal highlights for the weapons, and parts of the vehicles are highlighted with team colours when somebody is driving them. This, usually, does a pretty good job of telegraphing whether or not a vehicle is being driven by an enemy or not. Usually. Planes and helicopters are my bane. They move so fast and are often just far enough away that I can never tell whose team they're on. On maps like this, where there can be a lot of aerial combat going on, it can be really difficult to tell friend from foe. And this is during the day. At night? It's anybody's guess. Despite this though, the aircraft all fit the theme and they all have really distinct silhouettes so you can tell them apart from each other. One area where the art falls flat though is the maps. Unlike the models, the maps have detailed textures. Rocks, grass, sand, hills. They're all textured and they're not particularly pretty textures either. They range from serviceable to downright ugly. And large open areas of grass or sand have very obvious repeating tiled textures that are pretty off-putting. It's not a deal breaker for me, but it's worth pointing out. At the end of the day, the visuals here aren't winning any awards, but the flat, colourful art style works well and isn't hard on the eyes, so I can't complain too much. Let's talk about gunplay. Despite the simplistic looks of the game, Ravenfield actually has some pretty nice gunplay. It's not super realistic or even really trying to be when compared to something like Battlefield, but it's also not just point and shoot like Battlefront instead opting for a kind of middle ground. Guns have recoil, and different guns have different amounts of recoil. The M1 here kicks quite high with each shot, but will take an enemy down in just one or two hits. The Patriot here, on the other hand, barely has any recoil at all, but needs far more shots to take someone down. And there are weapons like the RK-44 and the DMR, where you'll likely want to fire in short, controlled bursts. I wouldn't necessarily say any of these weapons handle realistically, but they feel pretty decent to shoot. My only real complaint on this front would be that some weapons just start firing bullets in a really inaccurate cone when you're firing them in full auto. The bullets don't really fly straight out of your barrel and instead just kind of spray about even when using iron sights. I guess it's to encourage people to burst their shots more, but it is my only real complaint about the gunplay. Similar to titles like Battlefield, there are also some ballistic physics at play here. Bullets have a velocity rather than being hit scanned, so you have to lead your shots when firing at a longer distance. And at really far distances, you'll need to account for bullet drop as well. The game does have controls for zeroing your sights, but at the moment those only apply to the game's two grenade launchers. You'll have to get used to using the mill dots and the long range weapon scopes. 
All this tied together makes for some pretty satisfying gameplay, especially when you're able to hit those really far away targets with a well placed shot. But this game isn't all guns and explosions, it also has a light tactics layer to it. At any given time, you can walk up to an allied AI unit and have him join your band of merry men. Your new pals will follow you around, go to where you point them, or capture any points you want. The controls for this are pretty basic, and by default it's all just line of sight stuff. You can't just tell them to go to the other side of the map and capture a point over there. You have to actually be close enough to order them to a location. That is, unless you have a squad leader kit. This allows you to point your men to any point in the map and issue commands, kinda like the commander role from Battlefield. It's still fairly basic, but you can do some serious damage with a large enough posse. There's also a general team strategy that you can change on the fly at any given time. You can direct your entire team to focus on capturing or defending certain points. You can choose which points they spawn from, and which points they'll move to from there, all through a really easy to use interface. You can also choose whether or not they follow those orders strictly at all times, or just loosely when it works for them. You'll probably want to do this because when left to their own devices, the AI can certainly be... interesting. The AI isn't necessarily bad, they're fairly accurate, and will move and capture points of their own volition, but I wouldn't describe them as particularly smart either. If you just play without touching the team strategy stuff, AI can capture a point and then more or less abandon it, leaving the opposing team to just swoop in and recapture it. The worst case of this I've seen is on the carrier map, where the team that starts the game with a big aircraft carrier filled with boats and planes actually ended up losing it somehow. I've only seen it once, but it left me absolutely bemused as to how this could have happened. On top of that, I've also found myself killed by my own allies, either from them abusing their grenade launcher or simply deciding that my head was in the way and gunning me down instead of politely asking me to step aside. The AI is also never as good as you are, even on the hardest difficulty. Sure, as a team they can still beat you, and the battles themselves are challenging enough, but if you're halfway decent at this game, you're always going to have more kills than anyone else. It's not uncommon to have a game where you're at the top of the leaderboard with nearly 70 kills, and the person just below you has 10. Ultimately, whilst the AI may not be the smartest, it's competent enough that you don't need to babysit them, and you don't need to play this like a tactical shooter if you don't want to. Just tell them what points you want them to capture and defend at the start of the match, and leave them to do their thing. Now, one of the advantages of being a game focused around fighting AI is how big the battles can actually be. There's no actual limit on the number of AI that can be in any games, so by default, plenty of them will have 30 units on either side, but you can up this to 50, 100, 200, 500, or even 1000 if you're running some crazy dual processor 64 core monster of a machine. Upping this number can be really fun, and really gives you this crazy sense of scale with the battles, like you're part of some huge army. You can even change the balance and have one team with, say, 150 dudes with pistols, and the other is a crack team of like 20, but they're using assault rifles and sniper rifles. You can really customise your games, right down to which capture points each team starts with, what weapons they have access to, and what vehicles they can have. The large battles, however, do hit your performance. If you're on a half-decent GPU, it'll never be your bottleneck, as the graphics are obviously very simple, but your processor will scream with high unit counts. I have a mid-range Intel CPU from a couple of years ago, and I can hold a stable 60fps in a 150-person fight, maybe 200 at a push. But beyond that, I sorta of have to accept that my CPU is going to be capped, and 30fps is something I should just accept. With newer processors, you may have a better experience, but Total War doesn't hit my CPU as hard as this game does. I guess now is a good time to get into my biggest issue with this game. All my complaints before this have mostly been nitpicking or relatively small concerns that haven't had any serious detriment on the experience, but this game's biggest issue is by far the sound. This is where the early access part of this game really starts to show its colours, and it's not just one aspect of the sound, it's everything. Where do I even start? I guess with the weapons? They don't just look like toy guns, they sound like them too, and I don't mean in a cute authentic way that adds a toy soldiers-esque vibe to the game, I mean in the bad way. Let's have a listen, shall we? So here we have an AK-47 type weapon. Okay, it doesn't sound awful, but it lacks punch. Same with this pistol, not the absolute worst, but pretty basic and again lacks any real impact. But this DMR? I don't even know what it's supposed to sound like. You'd think it's a suppressed weapon, but you'd be wrong. This game has suppressed weapons, and they somehow sound even worse than you'd think. Here's the suppressed pistol. 
No, I haven't turned the volume down. This is playing at exactly the same level as the other guns. It gets even worse. Here's the suppressed SMG. It's somehow even quieter. I originally thought this gun didn't have any sound because I couldn't hear it over the gunfire of the people around me. The worst part of all this is that not all the weapons sound bad. Look at the M1 here. It sounds like an actual gun. You can hear the metal of the gun being rattled with each shot, and it's even got the signature ping. To top it all off, the reload sounds are really snappy too. Some other guns don't even have reloading sounds. It's things like this that make me think that most of the weapon sounds might actually be placeholders. Again, this is an early access game, so it would make sense. To go along with the poor weapon sounds is the music. More specifically, the lack of it. Now, it's not fair to say this game has no music. There's a main menu theme, there's also a victory fanfare, and a defeat track to counter it. And... that's it. There isn't any music that plays during actual gameplay. Now, in games such as Battlefield, Call of Duty, or Tarkov, you don't really want there to be any music, as sounds can be really important. You want to be able to hear footsteps and gunfire so you can figure out where enemies are, and how close you are to them so you can catch them off guard or so that they don't sneak up on you. But once the gunfire actually starts in this game, you can't hear any footsteps at all, and there's never a severe enough lapse in the action where it could actually be able to hear enemies moving. I think this is an area where Ravenfield would benefit from being more Battlefront than Battlefield. See, in Battlefront, there's music. It's a somewhat unfair comparison because in that game, all the awesome action is punctuated by the brilliant works of John Williams, but I don't expect any game to reach that standard, but some kind of musical score in the background could really add to the atmosphere of this game. Give it that action movie vibe, and at the very least, it could help mask some of the other audio shortcomings this game has. One of the game modes actually has some background atmospheric ambience whilst you play, and it really helps add to the game. I know it might sound like a silly complaint, but I really believe this is a small change that could make a big impact. Lastly, I should mention the actual sound processing going on in this game. It's awful. There's no other way of putting it. To explain what I'm talking about, I'm going to have to get slightly technical. You see, Ravenfield is a game where there could be 1,000 units in the game at any given time, and every one of these units is making sound. Now, getting your PC to handle all those different sounds individually is completely impractical. That would be an insane load on your CPU and would be an optimization nightmare. I don't expect any game of this scale to actually play every sound that could actually be playing at any moment. So the engine has to choose which sounds to keep and which sounds to cull. It has to get picky. Battlefront does a similar thing. In really action heavy moments, if you pay attention, you'll probably be able to see someone firing their weapon but not actually be able to hear it. The issue is how this game chooses which sounds to play. It seems to not know sometimes what should be happening. So sometimes the sound of your own gun will cut out. Sometimes you won't be able to hear someone near you firing while someone 100 meters away sounds clear as day. It can be really jarring and the more units you add to the game, the worse the handling gets. Now, I should mention this doesn't happen that much when playing with say 60 or 100 bots, but Beyond that, the signs start to show, and it just sounds broken. Again, early access and all that, but it's worth mentioning. Okay, okay, I've ragged on the sound more than enough. Let's get back to something more positive. Just like Battlefront before it, Ravenfield has a conquest mode. It's fairly straightforward. Capture territories, these territories generate resources, use these resources to improve your army, rinse and repeat until you have control of every territory. In its current state, it's a little basic, but it's fun to play, so let's go over how it all works. Territories generate two kinds of resources, gold and research points. Gold is used to buy more garrisons of men. Research points and gold together allow you to research weapons, equipment and vehicles, unlocking them for the rest of the conquest. And this is actually really fun to play with. 
You start with just a basic pistol and AK, but you can upgrade your jeeps so they have machine guns. You can research the first weapons which are a grease gun and an M1 which changes your playstyle. You can even get tactical with it. With some map knowledge you can carefully plan out your research before a battle. Notice you're going to fight on a map with some land vehicle spawns? Research tanks. If you have tanks and the enemy doesn't, you've caught them at a serious disadvantage. Enemy planes getting you down? Research anti-air rockets. It's seriously rewarding and makes for some interesting matches that you may not see if you just fire up instant action. So, once you've pushed your way to the other side of the conquest map and found the enemy base, you get to have an epic uphill battle against the enemy fortress, where you've got to take all the enemy capture points one by one, pushing your way into the fortress until you claim it for yourself and win the whole campaign! Or... at least that's how it's supposed to go? Unfortunately, it almost never goes that way. In my experience, when you get near to the fortress in the conquest map, the AI usually spawns as many garrisons as they can and attack one of the adjacent territories, meaning if you win that battle, their fortress is undefended and you can just take it without an actual fight. It's pretty anticlimactic. I've definitely managed to have that final battle once in the past, but when doing my research and recording for this video? Nada. It may be worth having a permanent garrison on the Citadel map, just in case. Ultimately, the conquest is a little barebones right now, but still really fun. I definitely recommend it, and at the moment, it's the closest this game has to an actual campaign. It's a neat way to mix up the game a little, and it usually plays out differently every time. Alright, so we've gone over ways to play, but what about the actual game modes? Well, this game has a few, though they're mostly just variants of the traditional capture points conquest gameplay found in similar games. First we have points battle. Fairly simple. Killing an enemy rewards points. Every capture point your team controls adds to a multiplier. The more capture points you control, the more each kill you get is worth. Score 200, 400 or 600 more points than the enemy team, depending on game length setting, and you win. Then we have battle. Each team has a set number of reinforcements. Deplete the enemy reinforcements before they deplete all yours. Scoring here is based purely off of kills. Capture points just allow you to spawn from different locations and provide you with more vehicle spawns, effectively just the game's take on team deathmatch. Skirmish is similar to battle, but reinforcements come in waves and are airdropped in from a plane at intervals throughout the match. This means that as you kill enemies, their numbers actually deplete until a new wave spawns. If you die in this mode, you either spawn from the plane if it's going to appear soon, or instead you get given control of one of your AI teammates with all their weapons and equipment. Due to the limited reinforcement waves, this usually ends up being a shorter game than battle mode. Domination is actually a little interesting. Three of the available capture points on the map are chosen at random. You have to try and control at least two of these three in order to score points over your opponent. This happens in multiple rounds depending on the game length set, and each round a new set of random points are chosen. It can get a little swingy, and sometimes you can get lucky and the chosen points will be ones you control, or you can be unlucky and it'll choose three points that your opponent already has. It's fun, and encourages a hit and run style of gameplay as opposed to just grabbing a few points and turtling on them for the whole game. Now, those modes are mostly variants of the same gameplay, but there are two more modes that break the mould here. Firstly, there's Haunted. It's a wave defence mode where you and a squad of three teammates defend yourselves from only the spookiest of skeletons. Some of them even have guns. Each wave you have to move to a new location on the map and you get handed a new random gun. Or, you can choose to keep your current gun, but ammo is limited so you'll have to swap eventually. The game even gives you a car on the larger map so you don't spend too long travelling between locations, and on the island map it adds jack-o'-lanterns to help add to the spooky atmosphere, which is actually a nice touch. This mode is fairly bare-bones, but it's fun for a little while, and as mentioned earlier, it has the background ambient sounds which really help it. It's fun for a couple of playthroughs, but on its own didn't have too much replayability for me. Lastly, there's Spec Ops, but I won't talk too much about this mode, as the devs are currently working on major changes, but in essence, it's an objective-based mode. You get a squad of three dudes to help you complete objectives. At the moment, the only objective is just kill all the enemies, but it has a basic stealth system involved, so it encourages to use the underpowered suppressed weapons. In the next update, they'll be adding more objectives, and you'll have multiple per mission. I think this mode has some potential, but we'll have to see how it goes. As it stands right now though, this mode has almost no content whatsoever, and it's probably not worth playing it until it's updated. Alright, I may have saved the best for last. This is where the game really shines. Mods. Tons of the buggers. This game has an incredibly huge, healthy modding scene, and this game really is a modder's paradise. This is the kind of game where if you can think of a gun, it almost certainly exists as a mod. VSS and AS Val? Yup. SKS? Duh. Honey Badger, but of course. How about a Lee Enfield? Right here. Let's pair it with the Bren? 
Oh, look at that. Maybe a Japanese Type 38. There it is. I wonder if there's a musket. Oh, damn. You can really pick, choose, and personalize your experience with this game. It's not just weapons either. Vehicles, maps, even mutators can be added into the game with mods. So you can turn this modern combat game into a World War II shooter, or even World War I. American Civil War, anybody? Of course, it's not just real stuff. Maybe you're feeling nostalgic for Battlefront. There's a full pack of Star Wars weapons for you to pick from. There's even the modular rifle from Republic Commando in here. Somebody actually went to the effort of making a Battle of Coruscant space battle, and I've got to say, it is damn fun. Maybe Half-Life is more your cup of tea. Let's stage a battle between the Combine and the Rebels. It's got all the iconic weapons from the Half-Life series, even the gravity gun. Though, unfortunately, this does operate more or less like a high-powered melee weapon. There's even Combine dropships and Hunter Choppers with the iconic charge up and fire sound effects from Half-Life 2. But for me, my favorite has to be the Warhammer 40k mods. I can unironically say this is one of the best Warhammer first-person shooters ever made. Sorry, Fire Warrior. These mods really nail it. The bolters feel incredibly powerful, the TAU weapons are super accurate, the Space Marines are big. There's even the Dumb Orc rocket packs that the AI unfortunately can't quite figure out. Lehman Rust tanks, Valkyrie dropships, there's even Dreadnoughts. Somebody actually made a mod that makes Space Marines ridiculously overpowered with a massive regenerating health pool. And the maps. Oh god, can we talk about the maps? They nail the oversized gothic aesthetic amazingly well. Big destroyed cathedrals with Imperium frigates flying overhead. It's the Warhammer 40k universe realized by dedicated fans. It's a labor of love, and it really shows. But I guess this also leads us into some of the issues with modding. We'll start with the obvious. These mods are made by fans, often amateurs, and even within the same collections, these mods are made by a bunch of different people, so, of course, this leads to an inconsistency in quality. It's just the nature of modding. For example, the Republic Commando rifle I mentioned earlier, well, I have two different mods that add it. This one is really well done with the changing from an assault rifle to a sniper rifle to a grenade launcher, and it sounds pretty good too. On the other hand, this other one is just a normal assault rifle and the sounds aren't half as good. How about with Warhammer? These Space Marines look really authentic. Same here with the Tau. But the Orcs? These poor buggers look like rejects from Alone in the Dark. And I don't even know what's going on with the Necrons. But that's modding, and I don't want to criticize too much. Some serious effort has been put into these mods, and all of the ones I've shown here, even if they don't look great, deserve some praise. Unfortunately, that's not all that's wrong with modding in this game. There's also problems with how the game handles mods in general. Every time you boot up the game, it will load in every single mod you have downloaded. Those mods will stay loaded into memory for as long as the game is running, even if you're not using them. You could just be using Star Wars weapons, but if you've got the Half-Life mods installed, they'll stay loaded even if they're not being used in your game. This leads to performance issues. I had about three different collections of mods installed at one point, and the game was pulling in excess of 18 gigabytes of RAM usage whilst running, and the frame rate hit really showed. What makes this worse is that the best way of finding coherent mods is by subscribing to a collection. Remember earlier when I was showing off all those different guns? You may have noticed how each gun was its own individual mod, meaning that a collection that adds 50 guns probably has at least 50 mods in it. Not to mention mods that add skins, maps, and vehicles too. So, if you want to maintain decent performance, you have two options really. You can pick and choose the exact mods you want to use so that there's no unnecessary excess, or you can disable and enable the mods individually through the game's UI, unloading them from your PC's memory until you want them. This brings us on to the other issue with modding. The game's UI needs a serious overhaul to handle them properly. If you want to disable individual mods, you have to go to the mod list in the game and click to disable each and every individual mod which, as I demonstrated, can be a lot, even from one pack. This is a slow and tedious process and can take time. The game needs some kind of sorting method to separate the mods out from each other. There needs to be some improvements to this menu. The other UI issue is when you're picking the weapons and vehicles for the teams. You get thrown this big list of every single weapon installed, and it's pretty hard to pass and sort through, meaning setting up the configurations for your games can take time. Luckily, there's a handy save feature so you can create game configurations and save them so you don't have to remake them every time, which is a nice feature. Overall, modding is really what makes this game for me, and it's what sets it apart from many other similar games. My experience with Ravenfield was as such. I came for the Battlefield-type gameplay, I stayed for the mods. Ravenfield 
isn't a wholly unique game. It copies what other games have done and honestly doesn't iterate on them too much, but it knows its audience and caters to them well. It provides exactly the kind of gameplay you'd expect from it and does so nicely. It's fun and has tons of replayability. It has its issues and it's clear from the start that this is an early access game. There's some polish needed to really complete it. But what is there is really well done and what isn't there can often be filled with mods. I'd say keep an eye on this game. If you've liked what you've seen here, maybe even pick it up. There aren't too many games that offer this kind of scale and customizability, but it's here and it's good. Thank you. Stay tuned next time for another single player battlefield type game, this time with body swapping.